Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in on a Saturday. This is Product School's short talk on product management lifecycle. We have 30 minutes together today, and I'll try my best to see how we can do justice on this topic, uh, product management lifecycle, which at the outset I thought was a super easy topic, but turned out to be really difficult to distill in a short span of time but that's on me. So let's see how far we get. So we'll define the uh, life cycle in four phases. It's important to understand that each phase that we talk about today could very well be a talk of its own. So for example, you can spend an hour talking about feature prioritization, go to market strategy or product roadmap, for example. And yes, you'll find a lot of these talks on the product school website as well. But my goal here is to give you kind of a 30,000 foot overview of how we can approach to understand the life cycle and help you walk away with enough ammunition to go learn more about the individual pieces in detail. So let's jump right in. Um, before we start, let's get introductions out of the way. Uh, my name is Gopi. I'm a product manager at Microsoft. I started my, uh, my journey in engineering I really loved what I was doing. A few years passed and I wanted to get into product management and I scratched my head not knowing how to transition. Even lot, lost a lot of hair literally in the process <laughs> and then went to Berkeley to do an MBA. And during the program, I got an opportunity to switch to a job in technical marketing and then uh, later made the plunge into product management. Uh, I do realize that a lot of a lot of the folks tuning into the call today are considering a similar career path and I'm happy to help them out. And you can reach me on my email, which is here on the bottom right, which is my first name, underscore my last name at berkeley.edu. I worked for a few companies over the years, uh, Juniper Networks, Oracle, and most recently at Amazon and now Microsoft. So product management. So if you ask 10 product managers to define product management, you're more likely than not gonna get 10 very different definitions and answers. But believe me, most of it is right, depending on where they come from and which part of a PM's job they do most on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll try to be as generic as possible. And at least in my head, the way I think about a product management job is a PM wears several different hats and performs work that justifies the phase in which the product is in and depending on the relative maturity of the company that they're working for. So a startup, for example, would have very little brand value. They might have a single core idea that they're working on and a product that's just forming up. Most of a PM's job here would be centered around helping the concept mature and take the product through design and development. A large organization um, PM uh, may have a completely different role. A large organization may have lots of brand power. The PM might own one product out of a large product portfolio. Here, the PM's role would be more strategic in leveraging the company's brand value and growing market share for the business. So irrespective, I think we can distill the core responsibility to just one thing. A responsibility of a, a product manager is to guide the product from concept to shipping in a way that adds value to the customer and revenue to the company. So before we talk about the life cycle, it's important to call out the different lenses that a PM should use while working through the life cycle. I like to call out four personality hats. First is the innovator. The innovator finds interesting problem spaces and tries to match these problem spaces with the right solution spaces. Innovators thrive in ambiguity and are constantly tasked with the job of finding the product market fit for any new solution. Uh, they usually take a hypothesis driven approach to iterate on feature selection for the product. The entrepreneur, on another hand, is usually doing a mix of short-term and long-term activities. Short-term activities like everyday firefighting, uh, helping risk management on a, pro on a project, pacifying customers during escalation calls, 
or like supporting the sales teams uh, to help win a large deal or a contract. And they also work on long-standing actions like setting the product vision and getting the team excited towards marching towards this goal. The builder is the team player. He or she tags tag teams with engineering, works with stakeholders to help build features into the product in order to make it useful. And the strategist is preparing for the product's life in the real world. So how do you price a product? How do you take the product to reach the target customer? How do you build a go-to-market strategy? And how do you acquire the customer who's willing to pay for your product? So these are some of the questions the strategist want, thinks about. With that, we jump into the four-step flow that we will be looking at today. Uh, CODE is the acronym. And before you ask, yes, I did try to fit the acronym <laughs> so that it would help us uh, remember this more easily when we walk out uh, of today's talk. So what is CODE? Uh, C here stands for concept and idea. O stands for market opportunity and the vision that you want your product to march towards. D is for design and development and E is for execution and go to market. So I have this flow chart kind of traveling through um, the entire presentation. So it will highlight which phase we are talking about. So if we're talking about concept, you'll see this part highlighted. And you'll also see the persona right next to it, that which is basically the four personas that we talked about. Uh, so I don't expect you to remember these goofy cartoons, but if you stay with me, um, you are the innovator during the concept phase, the entrepreneur during the opportunity phase, the builder during design, and the strategic during execution and go to market. So we'll come back to this page just to remind us of where we are in this entire process. So let's go to the first one, concept. This phase is about three things. Understanding the problem that we're trying to solve, exploring and picking a solution. Here we'll talk about uh, divergent and convergent thinking. And the third is finding a market fit for the solution that you picked in, in this stage. Uh, I'd like to walk through an example to kind of bring the essence of the slide into the forefront. So some of you might have heard of the slope of, of this example as the slow elevator problem. So imagine the tenants of an office building complain to their owner saying that the elevator is too slow. In this case, the tenants have already framed the problem in a particular way. They pointed towards the elevator having the problem and they biased the question frame in a particular way. So here, the options for the owner of the building are limited to thinking about how he could fix the elevator and make it faster. He could probably replace the motor on the elevator, or he could install a whole new elevator in order to, um, uh, in order to solve this problem. But imagine the problem or the complaint was framed differently. Imagine the resident said, hey, the long wait time while we're waiting for the elevator is annoying and we need to fix this. So this opens up a different solution space for the owner. So the owner can now consider simple alternative solutions. So one solution that I can think of is maybe play music in the corridor where uh, people are waiting for the elevator. So they listen to music and don't feel so bored after all. Or just imagine just putting up a mirror on the side walls where uh, people are waiting so that they have a chance to look at themselves and enjoy their wonderful faces and in the, in the process forget about the long wait time. So the reason I'm giving this example is in order to uh, make us realize the importance of, the imp uh, of why and how we should frame the problem in the right way in order to reach optimal solutions for the same. So like I said, the first phase is what problem are we trying to solve? People often fall in love with the solution. We should do X or we should do Y, we should do go in this different hundred different directions without checking whether actually they are solving for the right problem or if the problem even exists. To counter that, all I would say is start with a simple but powerful question. What problem are we trying to solve? How can that problem be framed? 
do my state do my do my stakeholders agree on the problem and has anyone else in the industry solved this problem before the reason why i say this is such an important step is i want to give another example with respect to real world companies not so simple as the elevator example that we talked about so for example take uber we all know uber uber was founded to solve the problem that passengers have long waiting time for taxis on the other hand so they took a two side market approach they paid the uh, they paid the drivers they got uh, they got money from uh, the passengers and they built a platform to connect both of them a very similar uh, company started uh slightly earlier than uber i would say was get taxi now it's called get they went about solving the problem for the taxi drivers and who were finding it difficult to get passengers and today get organizes corporate fleets taxis and limo providers all on a single integrated platform and in contrast lift who we consider to be uber's uh direct competitor went about solving the problem for empty seats in cars driven home from college campuses during spring breaks now all these three apps provide some kind of solution but they targeted different problems and that makes the difference in their growth trajectories and how they will grow as a company so it's really important to fix fixate on your problem statement and make sure you have agreement across the board on the problem the next step like we spoke about in the in the three step process within concept again we're still in concept is the process of brainstorming for solutions uh most of us are trained to think in an in the most analytical way given a problem dissecting and analyzing it according to its merits while it is an important skill to have it's equally important to allow the ideation process to spread its wings to diverge and allow the opportunity for different possibilities to come and fit in as a solution there would be a time once you come, once you finish exploring possibilities where you need to start getting reflective and converge to a decision point but you first need to allow this divergent thinking to go through this may seem intuitive at first but imagine the number of meetings that each of us have sat through at our workplace where a problem comes up and someone on the team suggests a solution saying hey we could do this and then someone sitting on the opposite side of the table says hey no we've already tried this last year or last quarter it didn't work or they would give you five other reasons to shoot down the idea now this is exactly the kind of thing that breaks the ideation process we would want to avoid this if we want to come up with new and effective product ideas so what is divergent thinking divergent thinking is basically developing a climate within your team to come up with ideas where all ideas are treated equally without judgments and opening up the possibilities to think outside the box convergent thinking on the other hand is being reflective and being decisive and following a process of evaluation to arrive at how to solve the problem based on the choices that you discover during the divergent phase one approach that i've usually used during this process is scoring every idea and um choosing it based on the merit of the idea the last phase in the concept stage is a uh, product market fit and the way i like to define product market fit is where supply meets demand supply is the product and demand is the demand it has uh, among customers so you need to make uh you need to make a strategy for your product which is the pro which is your supply side of things where you need to uncover the value proposition of your product so one way to uncover the value proposition is to prioritize potential product features by grouping them into categories so one way i found helpful to um group these um product features is using the cano model where you have three categories of features you have delighter features which are like wow features which is like um going to drive the product to higher sales it's going to like really wow the customer once they hear about it performance features which is um which are how uh, how your products do better against the competition and basic must have features which are a must have to play in that particular category 
some means that I've found useful to do product strategy are using table comparisons with the comp competition, uh, plotting value curves, or putting your product on a relative positioning with, uh, with respect to a, a two by two chart or a product pyramid. On the left is the demand, like I mentioned, and in order to, um, in order to take on demand, you need to come up with a customer strategy. And the goal here is to understand the target customer personas and iterate on these personas by way of market research or by user interviews to confirm that these are actually the right personas who will buy your product. The insights from this step help us get very specific about the customer segments that we're targeting. And it also clearly outlines the pain points that these customers have. So the place where your customer strategy meets product strategy is your product market fit. Or like uh, Andy Rackler once put it, uh, he's, Andy is the CEO of Wealthfront. He said product market fit is identifying the features you need to build. Uh, the audience that like is likely to care about these features and the business model required to entice to buy them. And uh, as always with an example, Let's talk about the initial iPhone that was released. Um, before that, a lot of companies were making phones. You had the Nokia's of the world, you had the Blackberries of the world, who were still trying to solve the same problem. They were trying to make phones, but iPhone came at it with a new approach. It solved the customer point, pain point in a different way. It understood who the customer was, supplied the customer with wow features, and found its natural place in the market as a leader. I'd like you to leave uh, this section with a quote that pretty much summarizes um, what we just spoke about in the best possible way. So we spoke about concept. How are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, so we spoke about concept. Uh, let's jump next into opportunity. Um, opportunity assessment is nothing but market research. So market research is one of the most important gifts a PM can give to the organization in order to set a product vision. It helps uncover any trips or landmines in the marketplace that the product is likely to encounter. So it's a systematic process of collecting, analyzing, and interpreting information in the market. Um, market research brings market signals to the forefront. What I mean by market signals is, market signal is any insight that you can get that either reiterates that you're going in the right direction or does the exact opposite, tells you that you're going in the wrong direction and helps you redirect to the right path. So while market assessment is one of the most important steps, it's also important to remember that no PM in the history of the world ever has had complete data to take decisions from. So you pull from what's available and extract insights from um, whatever small size research studies that you can perform within the time limits that you're given. Uh, some helpful resources that I've found in the past are uh, research aggregators like Forrester and Gartner, uh, public databases uh, in order to find uh, information, industry journals or articles, and even uh, self-identified audiences who are willing to participate in surveys uh, in order to give you better insights about what customers are looking for in your product. Uh, once you're done with your market research, well, you've chosen your solution, and now there is a stage where, you, where it comes where the world is not a big white canvas, but you need to start focusing on what to build. And, any product manager would tell you that feature prioritization and choosing what to build is perhaps the most harrowing experience for any product manager. So I put this pyramid structure together to help visualize why prioritization is at the heart of everything. So I put vision right at the top at the broadest uh, portion of the pyramid to indicate that it's one of the most stable elements in the product strategy pyramid. It is the, the North star for all product development. And it basically divide, um, it defines an overarching aspirational state in which your product should be at. 
In contrast to your vision, a strategy is typically, uh, typically seen with a horizon lens of a few months. And strategy defines uh, the business goals and why it is worthwhile for your company to invest in this particular vision. Roadmap, on the other hand, uh, is the actual um, is the actual place where you need to take some hard calls. The roadmap clearly shows that you have finite resources to achieve a part of your product vision. So based on available resources and trade-offs from like market pressure or business opportunity or time to market, you prioritize features that you can build with the resources on hand and build a roadmap of the features that will build part of your vision and bring it to fruition and reality. And the best quote that I found um, to summarize this particular stage was from Steve Jobs, where he says, you need to focus on the things, not only on the things that you need to do, but it's also important to say no to the things you don't want to focus on. And for that, you need to have a really good market intuition and a solid market research to back it up. Moving on. So we've completed concept and opportunity like you like you can feel, I'm kind of scrambling for time because these are all uh, product talks on its own that could take an hour of its own to explain. So, but I'm giving you the highlights in order for you to go ahead and explore the individual pieces more in detail. So next we move to the persona, the builder who will be part of the design and development. And like I said, the builder is the team player who is tag teaming with engineering. PMs and engineers are the yin and yang of the product world. A lot has been said and will be said and hypothesized about the PM engineering relationship. And it's easy to feel like you're in a battle of us versus it's them. Uh, but it shouldn't be. I would like to look at this relationship as one that is complementary and interdependent. So given that much of a uh, of a PM's job involves accomplishing goals through others and influencing without authority, I would strongly encourage to have a better working relationship with the engineers. And that would make uh, the team's work a joint success. So in conclusion, engineers need product managers to do their jobs. Product managers need engineers to do their jobs. And if they both do their jobs well, you're gonna have a successful product and you're gonna have a successful business. So this is a good segue into our next slide, which is one key skill that a PM should learn in order to make this uh, relationship functional and effective. And that is cross-functional leadership. At the heart of it, the concept of cross-functional leadership is theoretical. The reason being that PMs don't have formal authority over the teams that they're working with. So these teams might be teams in marketing, teams in UX design, or teams in teams that are coding the design for you, uh, um, the research team, or the data science team, or the, or the program management team. So all these teams are working jointly towards the success of the product, while the product manager is the shepherd for all these teams, taking them in the right direction. It is important to understand that all these teams are equal partners and you cannot succeed without them. Uh, and it would augur well for us to remember that every single one of these teams have something unique to offer to the success of the product. So my only request is listen humbly and you become a better PM when you learn about the value that each of them bring to the table. I credited this slide uh, to my professor, Mary, who was, uh, who was my professor at UC Berkeley for my product management course. She often said during the course that it was important for the PM to take responsibility for the failures of the product, but credit the entire team for any success that the product had in the marketplace. So yes, it is a thankless job and it takes a specific mindset to succeed in this world. As always, a business leader comes to our rescue to summarize each of our faces. And this time it's Indra Nui, where it is important to understand that cross-functional leadership is all about motivating the rest of the teams to get them to follow your vision, although you have no direct authority with them. 
The last phase is execute and go to market. And like I mentioned, the persona here is the strategist. Execution is generally the step where the product manager plans for the life of the product in the real world. And this is defined by your go to market strategy. And go to market helps answer a number of questions about the product, the where, the what, the when, and the how. So where meaning, where can we reach customers? Where can you reach uh, customers to find, to find who will pay for your product? What influences these customers to buy your product? And how can marketing influence this decision better? So they call something as a purchasing decision funnel and marketing is all about how you influence this funnel to make the customer decide in favor of your product. The next question is what will customers pay? This is one of the most important steps, if not the most important in the product life cycle. So Pat, the pricing of your product. So it's important to understand what your customers can afford, what is the, their willingness to pay, and what is the premium that you can charge for your product based on the features that you have. So you also need to understand what pricing tactics to follow. We'll actually look at a a quick case example in the next slide, which I think will drive home this point about pricing. And the next two questions are the when and the how. The when is when do you what is when do you launch this product in the market? Are you a leader? Are you first to market? Are you a quick follower? Are you a differentiator? Are you second in the market? So it depends. All of this depends on when. What is the right time to launch the product? And you also have to decide on your channels. How are you going to take this product to market? Are you directly going to sell to customers or through channels or through partners? You got to decide on all of this. And finally, you have to set your success metrics and KPIs. Uh, last, uh, I would like to unpack go to market with the story of the Apple Watch. So Apple Watch, I think, was introduced sometime in 2015, if I'm not wrong. And there was a lot of speculation in the press about there were 70 million iPhones sold um, in Q4 of 2014. And how can Apple Watch um, be called a success or failure? Is it by volume? Is it by price? Is it by how much of market share they can get in the health tracker market? But it's important to kind of um, deep dive and analyze what Apple did. How did they find their target audience? How do they decide on the customer personas? What pricing and sales strategy did they use? So in order to choose the customer, Apple went for the premium customers and the luxury customers. They hyper-focused on them. They built collaborations with luxury brands like Tesla and Hermes. And they, in fact, built like gold-plated watches and like aluminum-cased watches and priced it really high in order to bring uh, the target customer was the luxury customer into this ecosystem. They marketed it in places where tech is typically usually not found, like in fashion magazines. Instead of the traditional Apple store only route or the retail route, they chose to, they chose to uh, put Apple watches in jewelry stores or high fashion boutiques in order to get the visibility amongst its target audience. Apple has always used its price skimming strategy, which means they had a high introductory price to attract luxury buyers uh, who respected the Apple brand value and were gonna buy irrespective of price and then gradually reduce the prices in order to attract the next and subsequent layers of the market. So this is interesting in a way that it kind of gives you about what are all the things that a company has to think about before launching a product in the marketplace. And last, like, um, this is a good quote from Joe that summarizes uh, what, what we're looking for in this particular phase. So I know we kind of skimmed through the last couple of phases, but it was more important to land the concept phase in more detail than the rest of the other phases. And in a future talk, I'll probably go into each of these in more detail and, and talk about it. So now that we've gone through the whole thing, I wanna make sure that you have some actions that you take out of today's talk. So hopefully uh, at the end of 30 minutes, you had an opportunity to get a 30,000 foot view of the product management life cycle. Um, this gives you an opportunity to double click on the pieces that interest you. It could be market research, it could be go to market, it could be product prioritization, it could be anything. 
So go ahead, try and get the 10,000 foot view, go, to, go and get the 5,000, 1,000 foot view by listening and reading more content on the individual pieces. Second, if you're an aspiring product manager, if you're trying to make the switch from engineering or from marketing or from elsewhere, uh, try to pair up with a product manager, find a mentor, ask them what C they're working on, what concept they're working on, because more likely than not, they already have the concept identified. Offer help on the O, offer help on market research, offer help on opportunity assessment. And market research is a step that any PM will gladly take help on. Pick a product of your choice. So I picked Apple Watch. You can pick any product that you like, a consumer product, or even a product from your own company. If you're working for a large organization, they may have multiple products. Pick a product, make a presentation to your internal team of your best guess on their go-to-market strategy. This gives you uh, the chance to think about it, uh, think about the product from the lens of the product manager and see how many things you got right, see how many things you got wrong, send it to the product manager who actually worked on that product, see where you are. So all these are steps to build connections within your organization and that way in the long run, prepare you for the life of being a product manager. So I hope this was really helpful for you. I wanna thank, thank you and thank Product School for this opportunity and thank you all for dialing in. I'm happy to take any questions or if we're out of time, uh, I would happy to take questions over email or otherwise over LinkedIn. Thank you all, stay safe and uh, have a good weekend, bye-bye.